Hello everybody, welcome back to the channel. So in today's video, we are going to be answering your questions yet again because it is Wednesday and we are going to be answering nine total questions. It's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to be talking about Chavi Hernandez. We're going to be talking about the comparisons between this season and the last season. We're also going to be speaking about a little of myself, if anybody even really cares about that. And then we're also going to be comparing Frankie De Jong with other players. There's a lot of different questions. I hope you guys do enjoy this one. And once again, if you do want to have top priority in the Q&A sessions and always have your questions answered, if you do join Join the membership within this channel, you would have access to that fully. And so let's do this. And we do have our first question coming from someone else nine. And he asked, what team is Chavi Hernandez going to be managing next? Now, I'm actually very excited with what Chavi is going to be doing next in his career. You know, we did first see him coaching FC Barcelona in Europe. Of course, he had other previous experiences, but it was not in Europe. It was in Saudi Arabia. And many of us did question whether Chavi Hernandez had enough experience to be coaching a team like FC Barcelona. And fortunately for us, he did. He brought enough coaching coaching qualities to our squad to the point where we were able to win La Liga with a very young squad and a team that was suffering a lot mentally. He brought the winning culture back. Of course, we had some obstacles, some mistakes that we have done in the past year and a half, like with every team, right? But now with Xavi Hernandez having this type of experience, knowing what worked, what didn't, seeing his playing style, his football, I think that everything does lead towards Xavi Hernandez coaching Manchester City in 2025. You better bet that is going to be the pathway for him. I don't think that Pep Guardiola is going to be continuing with Man City after the summer of 2025. Yes, there has been some hints about Pep saying that he might extend because he is happy. Who would not be happy if you were receiving all the money in the world to sign whatever players that you do want? Of course, Pep Guardiola is happy. He has a lot of flexibility, but something tells me that we might see Man City make a change and that change could be within the coaching role. And somebody like Xavi Hernandez would make a lot of sense because Xavi Hernandez and Pep Guardiola do see very eye to eye in terms of the football philosophy. It would be the easiest transition for Manchester City and Xavi Hernandez is also not going to be having those financial difficulties to sign the players that he does want at Man City. He's going to be saying, give me this player, give me that player. And then we're going to truly see what Xavi Hernandez has in terms of the capabilities within his coaching. He could have not really have done that with FC Barcelona because we couldn't sign the players that he wanted, like Kimmich, like the continuity of Messi, the continuity of Dembele, keeping Sergio Busquets, signing Erling Haaland, and so forth. You guys get the whole idea. So I do think that it would be Manchester City. And of course, if Pep Guardiola does sign an extension for another three years, then I don't think that Xavi Hernandez will be going to Man City and to take on the assistant coaching role. That's not going to happen. I think that Xavi will probably move to a team maybe like Borussia Dortmund. Moving on towards question number two, and that is coming from EKIM underscore B. And he stated, Kevin, what made you stop coming out to live in your videos? Because you used to do that. And yes, I used to have a lot of live sessions in this channel. But the reason why I haven't done those is because usually when I do those live sessions, not a lot of people can make it. And then a lot of people are like, oh my God, you should have done this earlier, should have done this later. Nobody was really satisfied at the time that I was making those live sessions. And yes, I did pre-record it and I did upload it later, but a lot of people wanted to actually be there within the live sessions. I did not get enough views compared to like my regular videos. And to me, that's not really worth my time. I think that it's much better to create these videos, craft these videos, right? To show you guys well edited type of content. So you guys can truly understand what I'm talking about when I have to show you guys pictures or videos or whatever it may be. I do think that I do perform better in terms of edited videos, not really in live sessions. And I know that many might question, but Kevin, you don't think that you should go into like live sessions during matches, like going live when Barcelona does play. I also think that's that is a bad idea because if I have to look at your guys' questions, whatever you guys do have to say, that also means I'm not going to be looking at the game itself. And when I look at games, especially Barcelona games, I have to put 110% focus. Like I'm really in tune with the game. And usually when I am in tune with the game and I'm very focused on what's going on, I don't really say anything. And I don't want to go on live knowing that I'm not really saying anything to you guys and you guys are going to be bored and then it's just a waste of time. So that's why in the end, I just stick to the edited type of videos. Moving on towards question number three, and that is Prince Carabao 6085. And he stated comparisons between last season and this season's first four games. So yes, I think that in this season that we are in within the first four games, we have played better compared to what we did last season. Last season in our first four games, we had one tie and three wins and allowing four total goals while scoring eight goals. And in this season, we have four total wins, no ties, no losses. And we have only allowed three goals so far in the first four games with us scoring a total of 30 goals. So it is a massive upgrade to what we did in the first four matches last season. I would even argue that our wins this season has been much more convincing, much more inspiring. Many youngsters are performing well and they're delivering us the good results. Last season, it was all about Ferran Torres, Lewandowski, Jules Kunde scoring goals, providing assists. Pedri also scored a goal. I think that it was in the second game of the season, but in this season, it's just much different with La Minimal being so effective with Alejandro Valdez doing well. We saw Bernal, we saw Casado, Cabarsi has also been playing well. It just seems much 
much more inspiring. Also, I would like to argue that we should have played much better last season within the first four games because we have just won La Liga. Like the momentum should have been great. We should have won 3-0, 4-0, 6-0 in our first four matches, right? Really dominate the opponent. But this season, we're playing better. And that was not expected because we were coming off a season that we where we did not win anything. We haven't won a single thing last season. And so it's much more impressive what we have been doing under Hansi Flick so far, given the context. Moving on towards question number four, and that is coming from Say Doboli. And he has stated, do you have a coaching degree? Do you have the ambition to work for TV? So no, I don't have a coaching degree. I don't have anything. I don't have any credentials. I mean, would I go for one? I don't think so. I think that if you ask me, would you ever get your UEFA license or something like that? I would say no, because I don't think that's my area of expertise. I don't see myself coaching any team at all. I mean, if the opportunity presents itself in front of my face, then yes, I'll probably do it because I'm not really scared of anything. Even if I end up embarrassing myself, I really don't care. But that opportunity has not really been brought up to me in terms of coaching any teams around me and, and around my area. I So I have no experience. I'm just somebody that I would consider that likes to talk a lot of shit about football, right? Like I'm full of shit apparently, right? <laughs> to everybody here. And that's basically it. And I make some sort of sense, I guess. And the second question is, do you have the ambition to work for a TV channel is what you were trying to say. I would say, no, I don't have any ambitions to be working on television. I just, I strictly like the fact that I get to talk about teams and especially FC Barcelona within my own, I would say control, which is YouTube, right? Because if I work on TV, I would have to have like other people tell me what to do, what to say, what to not say. And I don't want that. I want to be able to say whatever the hell I want and give whatever opinions I want. And YouTube does give me that type of platform. So I'm not looking to go into any professional type of career, like if it was ESPN or any other channel. It's just not in my, I, I don't want that. Like I'm good. I, I'd rather just talk on here on YouTube because it's a lot of fun and I have a better connection with you guys. I would say one thing though, and I did actually answer this in the previous Q&A session. The only time I would stop doing this and look for a different career path is if I end up in an opportunity where I can be either a sporting director or go into soccer operations within a club, whether that's in the MLS, whether that's in La Liga, that is the only time I will leave this channel and go fully on board into there because then that would allow me to work from the inside of the sports industry instead of working from the outside of the sports industry because I do think that if I can get placed in a position where I can become a sporting director or the director of soccer operations, I can make a true difference because I know what I will be doing. Trust me, like I will know exactly what to do to make sure that club is successful. I have a few ideas. I just need that opportunity coming from somebody to tell me, hey, look, we'll give you a year to do what you need to do and let's see what type of results you can put in. And I would welcome that because I know that I can. But yeah, that's basically it. Moving on towards the next question that is coming from Victor Mandela. And he has stated, do you think that Barcelona should still be looking for a big money left winger after what Rafinha has shown in the first four games? So regardless, whatever Rafinha does for the next four to five games and what he has done in the past four games, I continue with the exact same opinion. I still think that Barcelona should be or should have been having a great left winger. It could have been Nico, but Nico did not want to come. And Barcelona knows that. They know that they needed a pure left winger. They just couldn't achieve the signing of Nico Williams, which makes me think that in the future, whether it's in the winter transfer window or in the summer transfer window of 2025, Barcelona will be scouting for a left winger. And Barcelona most likely will be in a much different financial situation. So we don't know who Barcelona is going to be signing at that time, who is going to be in their ideas, what's on their transfer market target list. We don't know. I hope that it's Musiala. I continue to say that I want Musiala at Barcelona. I think that Musiala should be the top priority for the next summer because it just makes a lot of sense. Musiala's contract does end in the summer of 2026. And I do see Musiala as a pure left winger, somebody who can be very effective when dribbling forward. We need a player like that. Rafinha is a left winger that likes to run into space. We all know that. He is somebody that is not such a Neymar type of player, somebody who can take on so many players with his dribbling. He's not that. He's somebody who can run into space and he does it very well. It does not mean that Barcelona should let go of Rafinha. No way. Rafinha should have continuity because the level that he has been bringing, it is it has been massive and I want him to be here for a very long time. But it also it also does not mean that Barcelona should not be looking for a left winger. We should be looking for a different profile, right? Within the left wing position. And that is Musiala. Moving on towards the next question. And that is coming from Josco Boy O. And he has stated, would you swap Frankie De Jong for Joshua Kimmich? I would say yes, because Joshua Kimmich has more flexibility within his game because he can play on the right back position or play within the pivot position and play next to somebody like Pedri or play next to somebody like Gavi. With Frankie De Jong, he's very limited. I don't see him as a number eight, right? He could play as a number eight, but he does not have that creative power like Pedri does. And let me tell you another thing that's very scary. Frankie's best position is where Pedri does play, right? He's not a true, true number six, like a lone pivot. He's not the deepest player in the midfield, right? He's not that. His best game would be in Pedri's position and Pedri's not going to be moving anywhere, right? So now we have to question what happens to Frankie. And that's why I do say it makes a lot more sense to have Joshua Kimmich in for Frankie De Jong, take 
take Fra Frankie De Jong out and then bring Joshua Kimmich in, who can play in the pivot position. Moving on towards the next question coming from Shadin Gun 4797 and he said, first of all, bro, I don't know why you're screaming because you have it on caps. This is what he questioned. Ansu and Ferran both are considered as Lewandowski's backup, but what do you think who will be a better option for Lewandowski backup and who will be a god option? You mean good option, right? Good option of Rafinha's backup. So for sure, Lewandowski will be the main striker. Ferran Torres is going to be the second choice within the striker position. I think that Ferran Torres is showing great level as a number nine. We have seen a glimpse of that against Real Valladolid where he came out with one goal and one assist. It has always been said, right? You can even look back on my Twitter, right? I did tweet out something that stated Hansi Flick does bet on Ferran Torres to be the second alternative within the striker position and he sees nobody else. Now, what does that mean for Ansu? I think that Ansu Fati will have his chances to play as number nine, right? So that is one of the biggest projects that Hansi Flick has in mind. But I think that Ansu Fati is going to be moved much more than Ferran Torres. I think that Ferran Torres is going to have his set position, which will be the backup to Lewandowski. But Ansu Fati will be like the third option within the striker position, while at the same time seeing the left wing position, getting him more minutes. And that would also be the backup to Rafinha for now and for the next 10 to 15 games. Maybe Barcelona might do something different, sign a new player in the winter transfer window, but I highly do doubt it. Moving on towards the next question coming from Dobit Otis, 3630. And he said, Kevin, what do you think about Joan Laporta's decision to let Messi leave the club after he won the election? Was it the best decision he made to save the club? Because many Barcelona fans are still angry with him. But for me, I think he is 100% right because he knew the club's situation better than us as fans. Please, I'm waiting for your reply. Forza Barza. So, um, look, it did hurt me to see Messi leave Barcelona. I was, I would say, I was not emotional. I was just, I understood why Joan Laporta did it. And Joan Laporta said, you know, Messi has to leave because I think this is the best for the club. Yes, this is a very emotional decision for others, but we have to put the club over anybody else, right? It's, it's It has always been like that. The club over Vitor Roque, to all the Vitor Roque FC fans, the club over Frankie de Jong, the club over Gundogan, for the Gundogan FC fans, the club has to be over anybody. And it has always been like that. Because if you're going to put the club over Messi, you're going to be putting the club over anybody else. And Joan Laporta had the balls to say after freaking 20 years of Messi at Barcelona, I will be the president to let him go. Because right now, if we continue with Messi, knowing his salary, knowing how much we have to pay him once he does renew with us, it's not going to allow us to do anything for the next two years, right? Because like, really think about that. Barcelona were going for Luke de Jong, Adam Traore, Dani Alves, Aubameyang a couple of months after Messi left. Like Barcelona were that broke. We had no money. We were so limited. We have reduced, right? It has been said today. We have reduced our salary bill by 200 million euros. Can you imagine if Messi was still here with us? Can you imagine if Joan Laporta got emotional and felt like Messi should stay here because he has always been at Barcelona? Can you imagine Messi having continuity at this club? What Barcelona could have not done? It would have been a club in crisis for the next five to 10 years. We would have been so screwed. And Joan Laporta had the balls to say the club over anybody else. I know a lot of people will hate me in the short term, but I am going to say that Messi has to leave because we need more room to breathe. And we are going to be starting on rock bottom, but it does not matter. We have to push through. I've also explained this in the previous Q&A session. The first wave was all about Dani Alves, Adam Traore, Luke de Jong, etc. You guys know the whole thing. The second wave was for us to pull the levers, bring in Jules Koundé, Lewandowski, Rafinha, Christensen, Kessier. The third wave is now with those exact same players besides Kessier, and now we're welcoming in brand new La Messia players. If Messi was still here, there would have probably been a high chance that La Minima would have never gotten the opportunity that we saw him get in the past year. So I think that Ronald Porta has been doing a phenomenal job. He was 100% correct, and Barcelona is moving forward as a whole. Now moving on towards the last question, and that is coming from Marblehead07. He has stated, A bit of a strange question, but how big was the football fan base in the US? Did you have many people to share your passion with? Drawing tactics at school or endless Messi versus Ronaldo arguments? I'm asking because I don't know if I would have been that much into football if not for friends. Now let me tell you, dude. I, you know, the most popular sport in America, it is the NFL, which is American football. And let me give you guys like perspective on, on just how big American football is here in the United States. If you bring in the best product in the Premier League, which is the best game, right? Let's say Man City versus Manchester United or Manchester United versus Arsenal, because it has been said that those are the biggest games in the United States that, you know, that has been watched by the people here in, the, in this country. When you compare the viewership between Manchester United versus Arsenal, and then you compare that to a regular preseason game in the NFL, the preseason NFL viewership is much higher, much, much higher, my friends, than the best game that the Premier League has to offer. Because that is the only thing that America is interested in when it comes to soccer, and that is the Premier League. And even that, right, the best game for the Premier League does not even touch the preseason, okay, or regular matches of the NFL. The NFL is so popular here, it's going to be taking a few years, I would say 
eight to ten years for football to be catching up to American football in terms of viewership. Okay, so let's get that out the way. Knowing that, right, that still did not really affect me nor affect the other people within our school because I had my own little world and there was enough people that liked football, right? Just because this country is full of NFL fans. It also does not mean that we did not talk about football at all. And especially in my life, like there, I was in soccer teams. I was in soccer debates. We had a thing called Bleacher Report, something that existed before all of this. And we were talking a lot of shit on those comments, debating. We also talk, talked about it on the hallway when we had a break. And I said, hey, look what I said to this person. Do you agree? This and that. I had football was always part of my life. I had so many friends talking about football. It was a lot of fun. We always used to chat about it, whether it was Messi versus Ronaldo, Barcelona versus Real Madrid, or Manchester United versus Arsenal, or Liverpool versus Bayern Munich. It was very football heavy within the circle that I created. I, I would honestly think that I had a, a lot of influence on grabbing a lot of people into the debates and the viewership of football within my school. So yeah, I did have a lot of people to share with, right? Like I had a lot of ideas and I said, hey, what do you think about this? What do you think about this idea? What do you think about Messi being better than Ronaldo? What do you think about Messi scoring 91 goals in one year? It was really, it was really a lot of fun. But yeah, that is going to be wrapping up today's video. Thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you guys in the next one.